Hi, I'm Joe Calderoni. I'm the Senior Vice President for Communications here at Mount Sinai, South Nassau. Welcome again to our uh, Facebook Live audience. Uh, we're here uh, today with Dr. Frank Coletta. I'm, I'm really pleased that he's been able to take a few moments out of uh, what has been a, a very incredible, uh, busy few weeks for him. Uh, Dr. Coletta is a Chief of Critical Care here at Mount Sinai, South Nassau, and he's also a co-director of pulmonary medicine. Uh, he's been with the hospital a long time. He's very well known and respected in our community. Uh, and he is really uh, the tip of the spear uh, at the forefront, the very forefront of this uh, crisis that we're in. Uh, Dr. Coletta uh, oversees all the critical care and ICU uh, units. So he is seeing this uh, very much uh, every day on a firsthand basis. So Dr. Coletta, again, thanks for taking the time. We appreciate it. My pleasure, Could you Joe. just uh, walk us through uh, obviously, this, this disease, uh, this virus, uh, has really uh, uh, had a devastating effect on uh, thousands of people in our area. Could you just walk us through uh, why it is so uh, potentially deadly? So, Joe, the problem with this virus is that it has a very high level of transmission, unlike viruses that we've seen before. And second, it has a predilection for affecting the lungs, specifically the alveoli, the bottom part of the lungs, so that when it gets there, it causes an awful amount of inflammation and, and therefore respiratory distress. So our respiratory system comprises of two components. One is our ability to move air in and out of our chest. And second, and I call this the business end, is where the air exchange occurs, so gases such as oxygen, moves into your uh, bloodstream and then carbon, di carbon dioxide diffuses out. So that's the business end and that's where this virus causes a problem. It causes such inflammation in the alveoli that capillaries start to leak and then fluid gets into the alveolus. And as you can imagine, if you have gases like oxygen trying to diffuse through now a membrane that's full of fluid and thickened, it's much more difficult. And this is what the virus does. It has a predilection for the cells that allow this gas exchange. And when that's impaired, you can imagine the respiratory distress that goes with it. So that causes this, the shortness of breath that uh, if you're in the uh, critical stages of this disease, that's what's causing the shortness of breath. Correct. Let's put it straight though. Most cases though, it causes very little inflammation, very little distress and 80% of the patients are home with a cold-like syndrome and then get better on their own. However, about 20% come to medical attention. Of those, about 10% end up getting hospitalized. And of those, maybe 2% end up in the ICU with serious respiratory distress. So as serious as it is, and it is incredibly serious, uh, the vast majority of people, 80% of the people, are able to recover at home with relatively mild uh, symptoms. That's correct. So while we're on that topic, I, I know we've said this uh, before, but when should people seek help? When should they think about, I better uh, call 911 or go to an emergency room? That's a great question, Joe. Our problem is that this is a, in the community, everyone's aware of it, but that doesn't mean that typical colds, flus, other respiratory illnesses don't happen also. However, patients get very distressed when they have symptoms that may go along with COVID, but also may be just plain old cold or, or flu-like symptoms. And so we, we, we tell patients, if you feel sick, if you have some shortness of breath, contact your primary care clinician, go through some screening questions, and figure out what the next step would be. Not everyone has to come to medical attention, and certainly not everyone has to come to the emergency room or the hospital. But if you are short of breath, if you're feeling short of breath... If you're feeling short of breath, out of the ordinary, contact your local clinician and get some more guidance. And of course, you can always call 911 as well. If Correct. You're if you get so short of breath that it's way out of the ordinary for your typical norm, and we know that some patients already have shortness of breath from their underlying diseases like asthma and COPD, but if it's out of the ordinary for you, and you're feeling as if it might be threatening to your life, please call 911 and get to a hospital. So let's talk a little bit about people who uh, are predisposed or, or who might be at a higher risk. If you're a smoker or if you've uh, been a vapor, uh, what are some of the other 
underlying conditions that could be, you know, you, you need to be cognizant of. Right. So, so we know this is an equal opportunity bug. It affects everyone. However, those who have certain conditions can be more affected than those who don't. So, age over 65, underlying cardiac or lung diseases such as hypertension, heart disease, COPD, asthma, those with immunosuppressive diseases, HIV disease, those who are getting cancer treatments, all of those, if they get the bug, just like you and I can, they have a more robust type of infection than, than the rest of us. So those are the ones that really have to pay attention to their symptoms and come to attention sooner. Be extra careful, err on the side of calling your, your physician, your provider. Correct. And or coming into the emergency room if, you, if you're feeling something that's really abnormal. Correct. All right, good, 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 good information. Uh, so, as you said, 80% of the cases resolve themselves uh, a small percentage uh, who are hospitalized actually need advanced care. What can we do to help the patients who are in distress and who wind up in the hospital? So we have a protocol here as far as what treatments are given to which patients. So we have uh, the less intensely ill who are hospitalized in independent rooms and are given certain medications to help with their respiratory distress such as uh, medications to open up their breathing tubes, um, other medications that might be uh, given for co-infections, because we're not always sure that if patients test positive for COVID, might not have another infection such a, as a bacterial infection, so they may get some antibiotics at the same time. And certainly oxygen, oxygen therapy in all forms, uh, depending on the, the level of respiratory distress and oxygen levels in their blood uh, is given to patients. Then if they progress, to a condition where they really can't support their own respiration, then they uh, have an advanced level of care in an ICU setting where they may get some other type of intervention such as uh, non-invasive or, or then invasive such as a, a ventilator such as this. Okay. So before we get to the ventilator, what about some of the uh, experimental drugs that we've heard about? So unfortunately nothing's been proven to work and to, and to, and to cure this disease. Um, but we're trying multiple different medications in trial form, uh, and some have been shown to have some minor benefit, but certainly not, not curative. For, so for example, uh, antiviral medicines, uh, remdesivir is one that's being trialed, and uh, we have a trial going on here also for uh, patients. We also have uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, which are antimalarials, which have been shown to decrease the number of viral particles in the nasopharynx, but again, not a cure, but something that we have, and, and when, we, when you have nothing else, we try what we have. But of course, no one should be taking any of those drugs without consulting without, a physician, without, without very close supervision. Without doubt. You know, um, I always caution patients, but don't, do not start medications on your own. Always consult with your clinician. Okay. So back to the ventilator, which is becoming a critical piece of equipment. We've heard Governor Cuomo talk about the need for more ventilators. Every hospital is uh, very much aware that we need more ventilators in the system. We have a ventilator here. Uh, maybe could you just explain how this works? If, if uh, you or, or a loved one do need this kind of care, heaven forbid, uh, hopefully you never will. But in case you do, just to demystify it a little bit, how sure. does it work? So, so let's remember, Joe, the crux of the problem here is in the alveoli, in the tiny little air sacs that can't exchange uh, oxygen for carbon dioxide so well. So what happens when, when that occurs? You start to feel more short of breath. When you feel more short of breath, you have to move more air in and out of your chest. To do that, that takes energy. It takes your respiratory muscles. However, you can't sustain a constant high demand to move air in and out of your chest very easily. And so the first thing this, this machine does is it pushes air in and out of your chest through a special tube called an endotracheal tube that gets put in your mouth and in, into your upper trachea. So that's number one. The number two, it can give you high levels of oxygen under pressure so that those alveoli can open up and the oxygen can penetrate better through that inflammatory obstruction. 
So again, two things. One, it works for you by relieving the um, excess amount of, pre of, of demand of your respiratory muscles. And then second, it pushes a higher level of oxygen through that inflamed membrane so it can get into your bloodstream. Now, unfortunately, in this case, in the case of this disease, if you have to use that, people could be on that for quite some time. Correct. For so what we're seeing is that this disease process causes a syndrome that we know about very well called ARDS, or Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And the normal course of that is that it takes a very long time for that inflammation to eventually die down enough so that you won't need the respirator. So right now we're seeing patients on these machines five, seven, 10, 12, 14 days, and hopefully able to get off. We're still early in the course. We just started putting patients on ventilators. So as time moves on, we'll be able to report more about how successful we are in getting these patients off respirators. So now we know, as we said, the ventilators are in short supply. Every hospital is trying to increase their supply of ventilators. We've heard uh, even Governor Cuomo has talked about uh, the possibility of uh, putting two patients, if you had to, in a dire circumstance on one machine. That's not something that's usually done. Are we exploring that? Or? Here at Mount Sinai South Nassau, we are exploring it. We actually have some contingency plans in case we need to do that. We have all the appropriate connectors and tubes that are necessary for that. Our hope is, however, that we're able to avoid that. Uh, we, we're getting supplies of ventilators every day. Today we got 27 more. Our 27 hope, more 27 ventilators. more ventilators, yep. Uh, the Office of Emergency Management, the state, the federal government, and our own suppliers have been very good at, to us and so hopefully that'll continue uh, and that we will never have to split one but if it's need be we will do it and we're looking at it we're, we're looking at it. it yep okay okay good are there any exercises that people can do at home pulmonary exercises to try to strengthen your lungs just in general not not necessarily because of covid but right so i i always tell my patients the healthier you are the better it is if you ever get sick so so if I had a twin brother and we were genetically the same and he could run 20 miles and I can't, so he's in much better condition than I am. We have the same set of lungs, but he does better. Why? Because he's trained. He's trained himself to be healthier, to be more in condition, to be more cardiovascularly fit. And that means exercise. And so, yes, if you have a better cardiovascular condition, then you have a much easier time coming through any illness, including this COVID. So get your rest, get lots of water, eat well, sleep well. Eat all. right, exercise, and sleep. I mean, that all, that all plays a role. Absolutely. All right. And it's never too early to start that, those good habits. Never, never too, too early. Late, never too late to start those good habits. Never, never too late. <laughs> right. Never too early and never too <laughs> never late. Too late. Okay. Uh, we have some questions from the sure. Facebook uh, audience. Thank you for uh, sending in your comments. Uh, this one's from Madeline. Does CO, uh, COVID, I'm sorry, does COVID-19 cause chest pain? It could. We see some patients who have some chest discomfort related to their inability to move air in and out and eventually tiring their respiratory muscles almost as if um, you know, over-exercising any particular muscle. So it is one of the symptoms. So it can almost feel like I'm having a heart issue or? We've had a few patients come in and told us that they felt they were having heart attacks. Huh. So, and it turned out they, were, they had a lot of lung inflammation, difficulty breathing as a result. Hmm. Okay, we've heard this uh, issue come up before. This is from Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Should I use Advil uh, or Motrin to reduce fever from COVID? So the current, um, recommendations are to avoid medications such as Advil, Motrin, or non-steroidals. Potentially, this virus can cause problems with the kidney function. Those also cause problems with kidney function. So it's best to treat any fever, muscle aches with acetaminophen. Tylenol. Just Tylenol. Tylenol. Okay. So you're adhering to that and this is right the advice now. you're giving people. Correct. Tylenol over Advil Correct. if you have a fever. Correct. Okay. And, and the symptoms that might go along with COVID. Okay. All right, uh, this is from Janice. Uh, let me see if I'm understanding this. Not sure I'm getting this. Uh, would any of, would either 
anything you're taking help prevent the virus? Is there any medication on the market that would help prevent the virus? I wish there was. And if, uh, if there was, I would share with everyone. But there's been nothing proven to avoid it. But I will tell you, again, prudence. So social distancing, six feet away, washing your hands frequently, uh, avoiding people who you know have COVID or might have COVID are the best ways to, to stop this from spreading. So the social distancing, as difficult as it is, and the longer this goes on, it, you know, the kids are home from school, we haven't seen our families, uh, it's not easy on everyone, but it is critical in, in trying to flatten the curve. Very critical, and we know it works, and it's one of the best things that we have. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, I think that's all we have from our Facebook audience. Dr. Coletta, thank you very much again for taking the time. John, you're welcome. And uh, good luck as we go forward. Thanks very much.